The African and Eurasian plates start to move toward each other, trapping a third, smaller Iberian plate between them. The three plates collide. The Eurasian plate is pushed downward into the mantle, chopping off the Iberian plate. The Tethys Sea begins to close. As the Eurasian plate grinds underneath the African plate, it pushes the Tethys Sea floor and part of the Iberian plate 600 miles north and many thousands of feet into the air. Rocks that started life on the bottom of the ocean end up at the top of the Alps. Quite fascinating to, to imagine that if you are on top of the Matterhorn, you're actually staying on top of Africa. For geologists, Africa stops in the Alps. Over the next 100 million years, the continents continue to smash together. New mountain ranges start forming around the globe. The largest, the Himalayas, form as the Indian plate charges northward toward the Eurasian plate. It moves at two inches per year, lining up a head-on collision. The movement of the Indian plate leads to a clash between two giant continents and creates some of the highest structures ever to exist on Earth. The incredible power of continental drift not only builds mountains, it also sculpts one of the world's most recognizable landmarks, the Grand Canyon in Arizona. The Grand Canyon is a great scar on the surface of the Earth. Geologist Ron Blakey has been studying the canyon for over 30 years. It's just a wonderful place to come face to face with planet Earth. The Grand Canyon is 277 miles long and up to 18 miles wide. At its deepest, it stretches down for over a mile. The gorge exposes the interior of the North American continent. It's like looking through the pages of a book. Each layer tells a story about the past. One of the really neat things about Grand Canyon is as we go up the walls of the Grand Canyon, it's just like going through a time machine. Layer upon layer of rock reveal the geological history of North America from present day to two billion years ago. The deeper you go, the older the rocks. By studying the layers, Blakey can piece together the history of the canyon. He finds some of the most interesting evidence at the very top. Fossils of ocean creatures. Wow. This bed's the jackpot here. What we have is a extraordinary example of a Permian seafloor. The most important thing it tells us with respect to the Grand Canyon is that this area had to be near sea level when these rocks formed. Now it's 7,000 feet above sea level on the rim of the Grand Canyon. So something had to happen. Either the sea had to fall 7,000 feet, and we're pretty sure that didn't happen, or this landscape had to be uplifted 7,000 feet. We're pretty sure that happened. 250 million years ago, the canyon starts to form as a result of a collision between the Pacific and North American plates. They collide with such force, the North American plate thrusts more than two miles upward. What was once seabed rises over a period of 15 million years to form a vast plateau far above sea level. It stays that way for millions of years until it is transformed by water erosion. Six million years ago, several hundred miles south of the canyon, plate movements open up the Gulf of California to the sea. For the first time, small streams in the Rocky Mountains could empty into the ocean. So if we're starting a stream at 14,000 feet in the Rocky Mountains and carving down to sea level, and the Grand Canyon just happens to be in the way, the Grand Canyon's gonna get cut out. 
These streams merge to form what is now called the Colorado River. It cuts down through the land, heading to the Gulf of California. It took a river to carve the canyon. The water has carved down through the rocks, layer by layer by layer, removing material out of the canyon and leaving the great void that sits behind me. The Grand Canyon is a testament to the awesome power of the continents in shaping our world.